Good morning, everybody, to the uh, new webinar of the XX Energy Transition Series of the EHPA. We are talking today probably about the most important issue that we are all facing that are occupied with uh, decarbonizing heating and cooling, the renovation sector. So we would like to shed some light on possible opportunities. We would like, like to enlighten you on the uh, usefulness of heat pumps in renovation. Is it really possible to use them? Is the building stock still too inefficient to be heated and cooled by heat pumps? Is the technology too weak to do all this? These are questions that I want to discuss with my panel of distinguished speakers. We have Christiana Papazairu from LG Electronics. Uh, we have Lukas Bergmann from Sunamp um, Batteries, and we have Albert Lasko from Panasonic Heating and Cooling Solutions. Uh, we will just let me just give a brief background on the situation because data is surprisingly scarce. Everybody tells us that we have a problem with buildings, we have a problem with renovating buildings. We do not know exactly actually how many buildings that are that are already here today will still be here in 2050, but people say 80%. So there is a challenge. 70% of these buildings are today heated with fossil energy. Uh, and in consequence, renovating them in time will have to happen at least to a level that allows for low temperature heating. And low temperature heating is not 20 degrees, but it's something like uh, 45, maybe 50 degrees. That should be enough to provide enough heat for, uh, for hot water generation and heating even in cold temperature climates. We know at the same time that heatings uh, that buildings are responsible for 20% of the final energy demand, and then the numbers get a bit shaky. I have data from uh, from uh, from Denmark that has analyzed the whole European building stock, which is part of the work that we have done in a project called Heat Roadmap Europe, and part is an update of uh, of the numbers that is done by uh, some colleagues from Aalborg University. And they say that the CO2 emissions of the building stock are 14%. Nonetheless, we agree, I guess, that full decarbonization without decarbonizing the building stock will not work. And that's the reason why the European Commission is or has made the renovating the building stock one of the flagship actions of its current presidency. The executive vice president, Franz Timmermans, has announced that the renovation wave will be one of the key solutions for this, but we are not clear on what uh, what is in the renovation wave or what's supposed to be in there. There's a current consultation ongoing, so all of you are advised to go to the website of the European Commission and answer the questions that are presented to you there. What do we all want in the renovation wave? And at the same time, the European Parliament, under the uh, guidance of Karen Kaff, uh, is preparing its own initiative report on how to give full recognition to the efficiency of buildings in order to decarbonize them in order to use more green electricity. From an EHPA perspective, we can clearly say that for us, decarbonization of buildings means a mix of up to optimizing the building core and replacing the energy uh, carrier and the technology used. It will be to a large part, probably 60 plus percent, an electrified heat supply. And then there is going to be other solutions that are already existing or need to be developed which we'll not talk too much about here, and maybe technology of the heat pump, uh, heat pump technology development uh, of new technologies that we could then use also to renovate larger shares. With that, I would like to give my panel the first question that we have prepared, and that is really to get an insight into their own opinion. Where do we stand? Is the is the um, are heat pumps fit for purpose when it comes to building renovation? What requirements need to be fulfilled? And what's your opinion on these? Maybe we start with Christiana, we go on with Lucas and then Albert. Um, sure, of course. Uh, so good morning, Thomas. Good morning, everyone. Very happy to, to join this panel today. Um, so of course, I mean, the, the answer is obvious. Uh, heat pumps in renovation are perfectly fit for purpose. Uh, they are gaining momentum in almost all European countries. Uh, skills are there, so uh, uh, installers uh, are actually in a position now to address the technology um, and uh, they are assisted in various ways by 
I, I would say a big majority of manufacturers in how to either upgrade their, their skills or even make sure that the installation happens in best possible conditions. There are um, application-based tools to uh, uh, accompany them during the, the installation so that errors can be avoided. So in that sense, we offer a maximum of flexibility to, uh, uh, let's say, installers who have to make the have to make the job. And then at the at the same time, for um, the end customer, the, the very user, uh, we are also providing him uh, with uh, also web-based tools to make simulations to be able to make a, a smart use of uh, the technology. Uh, to follow the consumption, to make uh, uh, adjustments and uh, settings so that uh, the unit can run uh, according to his uh, um, use and li living patterns. So I think that more flexible than that, you cannot possibly get. Uh, I will not even mention the size and the piping length that uh, can accommodate literally any type of uh, uh, of dwelling or, uh, or building. So um, in a nutshell, you can see uh, heat pumps in both residential and commercial applications. Installers are skilled to make uh, the best possible uh, installation. Um, end users are uh, equipped with uh, all tools uh, that can make their lives easier. So I think that flexibility and heat pump uh, is probably a very a very good way to put it. Super, that's, that's a good start. I, I like that you mentioned also uh, upskilling the end user and providing tools to the end user so that they can make better use of the technology. Lucas, what, what's your take on it? Are we ready? Yes, we are ready uh, technology-wise. Um, from a perspective of the UK and some other markets in Europe, I think that there is still a skills gap um, because um, if we look at the challenge that is ahead of us, um, there are still too few installers that are um, actually well enough trained to install these systems. Um, I am speaking more from a, a single family home and residential perspective here though. Um, we have to, to acknowledge that we are installing um, uh, 8 million boilers a year around about in, in Europe every year. Um, and the heat pump market is still a, a, a only an eighth of that, roughly. Um, in the UK, those numbers are even, even further apart. Um, but with regards to the technology, we, we absolutely agree that, that the technology is there. Um, problems that we have seen in the past um, around um, inefficient sizing and design of the systems uh, are being addressed by manufacturers. They're also being addressed um, very proactively by the industry itself. Uh, we ourselves are now engaged in several programs to create new training um, modules and, and training programs for installers. Um, to learn how to properly size and design a heat pump installation. Um, and we also see that um, increasing automation of the operation of the systems um, helps to um, make sure that they run efficiently. Um, and also generally the, the application uh, envelope of heat pumps is, is ever increasing. Uh, we are now seeing um, systems coming out onto the market which uh, easily reach uh, 65, 70 degrees centigrade flow rates. Um, so these would be suitable even for the uh, most difficult to uh, re to renovate uh, buildings that, that, that you can imagine. Yeah, I, I do agree. Um, and do you do you think that these uh, these batteries that Sunlamp is offering will they make will they provide a major change to the way we can use heat pumps better in the built uh, built environment? Well, that 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 is certainly our um, our opinion. Yes, absolutely. Um, they allow you to do do to do two things. First of all, they allow you to uh, get heat pumps into dwellings where previously it was deemed impossible because uh, of a lack of space for hot water tanks. Um, and secondly, um, they allow you to fit enough storage, even in small dwellings, to be able to benefit from uh, flexible tariffs and off-peak tariffs, um, which essentially allows a much cheaper uh, operational cost for the end user. 
Super. We come back to that a bit later. Albert, what, what's your opening remarks? What's your take? Are we ready? I think well, I fully agree with my colleagues with, with all the points that they mentioned. Basically, we are ready. The, this is not new technology, so it's very old technology. What happened is that now there are much more uh, companies that can provide heat pumps into the market, so this is gaining popularity. Also, all uh, manufacturers with all technologies also are joining to, to this new trend. So this is a good signal, and, and also the heat pump is very flexible. So we we'll know, and, and probably when we see the, the case studies, we'll see that uh, heat pumps are really flexible and also can bring additional benefits. So we could not only heat the house uh, or providing hot water for for domestic hot water, also we could even cooling the house. So this is something that is completely new, and unfortunately probably this will be more demanded in around Europe, not only in the South, or South Euro, or Euro, European countries. So um, uh, in terms of uh, flexibility, there are many things that are giving choices to the customers, to the installers, to easily allocate the heat pump, the, the indoor, if we have a split systems into the right place, also to combine with, uh, with uh, photovoltaic panels. So this is giving us a, a big field uh, that it's giving a lot of flexibility. And, and the, the big challenge is that the installers normally are, are not uh, working only in one, one category. So they, it's difficult to find uh, installers or companies that are combining uh, these PVs, these uh, heat pumps, everything, to really bring a, a good solution to, to the end user. Okay, but every time we are watching more and more, so this will be more more easy to find, but uh, we need to to give them a lot of training and a lot of tools, software uh, tools for designing installations and all these type of things that my colleagues also mentioned. Well, that that uh, is a very optimistic opening that um, that I think is a good basis for further discussion. Um, let's look at the current developments in uh, under COVID nineteen. Do you think? And I think we will not spend too much time on it, but I just want to mention it uh, nonetheless. Do we? Do you think? Do you see that the pandemic has slowed down the development in the heat pump sector? Um, Pick it if whoever wants first. Okay, Thomas, shall I shall I go yeah. on? Yeah. All right. Yes. Yeah. Uh, well, the COVID crisis um, has been a change of a paradigm. Um, Due to the circumstances, of course, some uh, works have been delayed or suspended. But I think that people uh, have actually been forced to spend more time at home. And probably it was an occasion for them to experience how comfortable the dwelling was uh, on a 24-7 basis. So a much more uh, intense use as opposed to uh, when life goes as planned. Uh, and maybe uh, this will be a trigger for people to consider uh, upgrading uh, and making their dwelling more comfortable. Uh, so a renovation could probably be triggered as a result of the COVID crisis. We also saw that, um, um, so this is from a comfort point of view. Um, at the same time, when we think a bit further and look at the carbon emissions from the energy sector, there has been an approximately 8 to 10 percent drop in carbon emissions during this three month period. Uh, but we will actually need a sustained 10% reduction of carbon emissions over the next 10 years to be able to achieve the objectives of the Paris Climate Agreement. But we mm -hmm. cannot switch, you know, we cannot press the switch off button every year. So, thinking even further, the real problem is the fossil energy, which is still massively present in our lives to heat and cool homes or to be able to drive a car. So, I think that this is the, 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 the amount of... Um, of understanding that uh, we have at this stage and uh, we're really confident that uh, uh, homeowners will really uh, be ambitious uh, and try to to make the best choices in the in the months to come as a result I mean, of this crisis mm. when you mention comfort do you, do you see in your I, mean, I think maybe three months is enough to to see a change in behavior do you see an increased demand for products that increase the comfort that maybe provide heating and cooling at the same time which at least the air source systems can do and many of the air water systems can do the same so the heat pumps are in principle capable of doing that 
is that something that you see that that end users request more? The, the short answer would be yes, but maybe I could leave the floor to to other colleagues to to address the question. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. I mean, that that would then be the next question also to you, Lucas, and you, Albert. What about yourself? Do you do you see uh, declining demand, or do you see stable demand? Do you see maybe even an increase? Because as Christiana said, people found the time to think about what they should do with their home and what needs to be done to make it more comfortable. Maybe Albert. Uh, uh, yeah, so I think the, this lockdown period has been a period for not um, bringing to your home someone to make renovation of your heating system, eh? but has been the time to to think many things uh, about how how we made wrong in the world. Eh? So maybe we had time to think that maybe the the way we are running or we are using the the car, we are using the energy, we are using the things that we are buying that maybe we don't need. So people is thinking about about all this. Eh? We know this is already in, in the mindset of many young people, but uh, for not so young people like like my my age, um, sure we are thinking what can, we can improve. Okay, so and and Chris also said that we are spending a lot of time a lot of time at home, and we are thinking to invest in our home. So uh, most of the people. Uh, take this time to paint the walls, to make some refurbishment that they could do by themselves. So investing at home is something that will gain, will be increased in the future for sure. And parallelly, we have all these uh, regulation around the, in different countries in Europe that it's promoting that uh, heat pumps are the good choice for heating. When you are thinking in renewing your heating system, heat pump is the right choice. So we are uh, watching the incentive in Germany that it's quite new and different countries that are incentivating that, okay, I will invest in my home. Maybe uh, I need to put some money, but um, I, I might have some in incentives, some support from this government, from this other. Also some banning uh, legislation that is happening in other countries to, okay, if you want to renovate, you cannot use uh, fossil uh, energies. So all mm -hmm. these type of things together are making that during these two months, maybe the, the people stop. They did not refurbish their home, but they change their mind and they will invest probably more in the future. So we, we don't forecast a, a, a lower demand for heat pumps. You, you have a lot of experience in marketing, I bet. Um, do you think that what you said is commonly understood, that heat pumps are the right solution? And if I may specify the question even more, do you think that this is also true for innovation? Would you say that your own experience and maybe studies and insight from the markets confirms that people have understood that if they replace an existing boiler, a heat pump is a good solution, is a feasible solution? So what I learned is that country by country, it's completely different story. So if you go France, it's completely different story than if you go to Spain. Eh? I'm in Spain, in the place I'm based, uh, nobody knows what is heat pump. They only know about uh, gas boiler eh? because there is a big lobby, no legislation, incentive. Uh, not long time ago, we had incentive for gas boilers and not for heat pumps. So you try to explain to someone that you can, with electricity, you can heat your home in more efficient way and, and even saving money. Uh, this is difficult to believe in some countries and more easy to believe because they had more experience in other countries. But uh, there, uh, there are a lot of things that, again, eh, uh, regulation, the legislation has to a lot to do in, in the countries and also the associations, the local associations. So also they need to educate the people, educate the architects, the design offices, and, and the, the city halls when they invest in new uh, social housing. So there's a lot of work to do. And I will say that each country is at different stage. Okay, Lucas, maybe you can also add some, some of your experience on this. You have analyzed markets and end consumers for yep. a long time. Do they know that heat pumps work, or is everybody more like Spain, where they say no, that doesn't that doesn't fulfill my requirement? I think I think that we are getting there. Um, as as Albert already said, uh, different markets are at various different stages in that process. 
Um, but in uh, France, for instance, I think that heat pumps are now uh, pretty widely acknowledged and accepted as uh, as as a, as a technology for heating uh, going forward. Um, but it also, I mean, this is being pushed and supported by the right types of incentives, of course. Um, in other markets, in Germany, I think they're certainly accepted, but still more in the in the new build niche than um, than in other markets. Um, and when I look at the UK, um, we do see more and more engagement. Um, at the moment, it's um, institutional players that are really that have embraced the technology from our point of view, um, and are trying to find ways to make it um, economically attractive and 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 feasible uh, for their requirements. Um, but we also see that more and more end users are engaging with the technology um, despite all the economic hurdles that are still existing. Um, but we also see in the UK in particular um, a lot of engagement now around flexibility, uh, variable tariffs and, and uh, yeah, more modern tariff structures which really push people um, to engage with the technologies that allow them to, to exploit the benefits of these. Um, this is still in the very early adopter stage mostly, but uh, it is becoming more and more uh, commonplace. Um, with regards to, to COVID-19, we, we have seen uh, a drop in, in demand from uh, the, the normal residential sector uh, because, of course, uh, what Christiana and Albert already mentioned, um, installers couldn't go into houses, they couldn't uh, do specifications, etc. But where we have seen um, no slowing down in pace um, or maybe even an increase is in, in requests um, and work for, for larger projects. Um, because there, most of the planning and design phase is, is desk-based and therefore there's no barrier uh, from COVID-19 or less of a barrier. And um, this is now starting, with, with the easing of lockdown, uh, this is now starting to, uh, to move into, into real projects and sales then as well. Very good. Um, we had anticipated that we should not only talk, but we should show some, show some pictures. And you were so kind to prepare some projects that visualize that we're not only saying that heat pumps work in renovation, but that we can show it. This, you, we could say, is even the background of, of, of this part of our webinar series, because we started last year uh, considering that many people do not know enough about heat pumps and renovation, and we collected very nice examples on heat pump applications across Europe, from South Europe to North Europe, from East to West. So we can say that in every country we have a couple of thousand installations where heat pumps operate at 55, 65, sometimes even 70 degrees, either as standalone solutions or in a hybrid setup. We have collected some very colorful pictures in a brochure that you can download, all of you, from our website that we call Heat Pumps in Renovation. And there is going to be a second uh, version of that eventually in the future. And Lucas, Christiana, and Albert have been contributing to this, to this uh, brochure. And they have prepared some slides for all of us, for the audience now, to see that there is um, money put where the mouse is in this case. I think we had uh, agreed that Christiana could start with that. No, no, you had the video, right? Sorry. I'm, uh, uh, I was I'm, uh, at the end. Sorry? Yeah. I, I understood I was going to be in the end. Yes. So then we, we start with Lucas with the, uh, the project that you have prepared, and we we'll continue with Albert. And then Christiana has a video that we will play a bit later. Can we switch the screen? Yeah, she should hopefully now be seeing my screen. Voila, we do. Good, very good. Yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot, uh, Thomas. It was a, a really great opportunity to be able to contribute to that brochure and to highlight some of the things that can be done with heat pumps and re renovation today, even in areas and in properties uh, where currently gas is being used. Um, before I start into that, uh, I will very briefly um, say a few words about Sanem, though. 
um, Sunamp is a uh, has it has been born um, in 2005 2006 when our founder Andrew Bissell uh, was sitting in his living room and during a very uh, heavy storm had to watch um, the waves crashing over the barrier um, next to his next to his garden um, and and reaching his garden. Um, Having read quite a lot about climate change uh, during that time, he was very well aware that this was just going to become the norm uh, in the not too distant future. And he was therefore looking into what can he do uh, in order to um, reduce his own impact on climate change. And uh, the biggest thing that he uh, identified was renovating his house and reducing the use of gas or getting gas out of um, out of his house. But um, all the solutions that he explored and looked at, um, he always uh, came up against one uh, major barrier. And that was that all of them required huge amounts of heat storage to be economically uh, attractive. Um, and that has, uh, fast forward to today, led uh, to Sunamp uh, having become the uh, Europe's leading provider um, of phase change material heat batteries. And we are um, now offering a full range of products, both in the residential, but also the commercial sector, um, ranging from the equivalent for residential of a 70 to 300 liter water tank and in the commercial space, depending on the operational profile, uh, the unit uh, would replace uh, several thousand liters, thousand liters of water. Um, all our thermal stores in the residential uh, space are uh, A plus rated, so they're very energy efficient. And our material has um, RAL, RAL uh, quality certification grade A. Um, it's the only product in the world that can claim this. Um, we would have liked to gone further, um, but unfortunately, this is where RAL's uh, certification um, ends. Um, but a few words about uh, PCM and, and heat batteries. Um, most of you may have seen this type of product before, a hand warmer. And when you click the disc in this hand warmer, it will uh, become solid and it will become hot. So this is now sitting at a nice temperature of around uh, 58 degrees centigrade. And we use the same type of material um, in our heat batteries. And why do we do that? Because it can store a lot more energy um, than uh, the equivalent amount of water. Now, the benefits of our heat batteries are that they have extremely low heat losses. I've already mentioned that they're all uh, A plus rated. Um, they do not store water, but they heat it up on demand, uh, which is uh, great with regards to Legionella risks. They are maintenance free and they are four, three to four times more compact than water based storage. What that means for the end user is that you have more space, you have less costs, and you have no hassle with maintenance or legionella risks. What it also means though, is that you can play with the storage that you have. So you could e either use a lot less space for the same amount of energy or hot water provided. Um, what you see here is a 200, 210 liter water tank and the equivalent sized unique heat battery. Uh, a unique nine or alternatively you can have three to four times the amount of energy stored in the same space in this cupboard that you see here on the bottom right um, we have the equivalent of about 750 liters of water storage in these four batteries and we have systems um, or combinations of batteries that um, are equivalent to 1100 liters in roughly the same in the same footprint, uh, but slightly higher than this. Now, why is that interesting or important for heat pumps and in renovation? Um, what we have, what, what we are seeing is that in order to get gas and in particular gas combi boilers out of um, existing buildings, um, you always 
find that you have problems when it comes to citing or locating the hot water storage. And this was, uh, amongst other things, the case in the Core 364 project, which was a project or is a project between Gen2, uh, a housing provider in uh, the northeast of uh, England, NG, Kansas mm -hmm. Group, and Sunamp. The project um, is removing 364 combi boilers out of apartments in seven tower blocks, like the two that you see here on the on the left hand side. Um, thus, uh, these these combi boilers were emitting about 600 tons of CO2 per year. They were a high fire risk, which, of course, because of the horrible uh, events uh, at Grenfell in London, um, has become the UK has become very, very sensitive about. And they were also uh, leading to a very high maintenance cost. Now, they were facing an issue um, in that there was no space to site a hot water tank. So instead of using a, a standard cylinder, they looked uh, to us, they came to us and uh, they used sun and heat batteries, um, which are located in a cabinet that is uh, not much wider than 40 centimeters. Um, the system that was installed uses joint ground loops um, with 364 individual uh, ground source heat pumps. And um, the project is reducing the uh, CO2 emissions by 70%. And this is falling even further uh, because the UK grid is uh, decarbonizing at an unprecedented pace. The fire risks uh, are greatly re reduced, if not even removed. Um, there's no Legionella risk because, as I said, we are not storing hot water. Um, there is a very low maintenance uh, requirement. There are no billing issues, and that is quite important in the UK um, market, where it's not very common to have um, uh, joint joint heating systems and and then solutions for to bill uh, the heat used. Um, and and that was a, a big sales point as well. Um, during the installation of these systems, uh, the own, uh, the occupants did not have to leave the house. So all of this was installed uh, during full occupation of the tenants. Um, the project was uh, put on hold um, during the, uh, the early COVID-19 uh, phase, but will will resume uh, shortly, if not if it hasn't already. Um, but the other example that I mentioned is using more storage in the same amount of space and. The image that I was showing early here on the left hand side is actually from a project that we are carrying out in Oban in the Highlands, where uh, 140 homes are being retrofitted with heat pumps, with high temperature heat pumps in this case. Um, and the challenge was how to retrofit these homes, which already had relatively good insulation levels, um, to an efficiency standard um, without impacting the running costs of the of the occupants. The solution of choice in this case was to use monoblock air water heat pumps, um, in this case uh, from, from Panasonic, um, combined with unique heat batteries which are equivalent to 750 and in some homes 1,100 litres of heat storage. What that means is that the mm -hmm. occupants are now able to use to run their heat pump on an off-peak tariff. So they are only charged, they run on an E10 tariff, so they're only charged overnight and then um, twice during the day, um, which has a significantly lower cost than uh, standard electricity tariffs. We've achieved a 59% reduction in carbon emissions. And again, this is falling even further because of um, the decarbonizing grid in the UK. Um, actually, uh, the north of Scotland has been sitting at zero uh, grams per kilowatt hour for a significant amount of time uh, this year already. Um, we have achieved a 55% reduction in running costs and we have achieved the energy efficiency rating target um, that, that the um, housing association was looking for. So, in summary, um, heat batteries enable heat pumps even in the most space-constrained buildings. 
They allow all heat pumps to benefit from off-peak and variable tariffs, and they are a perfect match for heat pumps. Thanks, and that's the presentation of our case study. Impressive, and I have to say as a disclaimer, we didn't plan that the Panasonic heat pump is shown here, so that is really pure accident. Um, I would encourage the audience to send questions in in writing. Uh, you can use the questions box for that. I don't see any at the moment. I have one that, that is about the investment cost because you, you showed significant cost reductions, but does it pay off if I would be in the situation of having to replace my gas boiler? So um, that that there are big differences here between the different projects. Um, with regards to the uh, more single-family home-focused solution uh, in W that that uh, that um, we install in Oban, um, this is um, funded through an energy renovation fund. Um, so on a, for for a, an end user currently. Um, it would probably be still difficult, still be difficult, mm -hmm. um, but we see uh, the economics of this uh, solution improving quite rapidly. Um, with regards to the high-rise tower blocks, um, what we actually found was that once you go past, once you look past capex and um, the initial investment that is required to install the system, and you look at the operational cost savings um, from using these systems, um, the, the return on investment is actually very attractive. Um, the system currently uh, still uses um, a renewable heat uh, incentive uh, payment, but uh, even without that, um, it would uh, pay off in a reasonable amount of time. Um, and this is basically down to the fact that if you use hot water tanks in the UK, um, you will have to service them every year. Um, and that is an, a, a huge additional cost. Uh, you also have Legionella requirements uh, or leg anti-Legionella requirements that you have to meet, which you don't have to meet with our solution, uh, etc. cetera. Um, another um, benefit of our product in this case was that um, water tanks, unvented water tanks in the UK need to have an overflow or a pressure and uh, temperature uh, relief. So that means that there can be water coming out of them um and that has to go somewhere and because these are installed inside the building and not on on a on the outside or a facade um this is quite difficult um and actually would have increased the cost of the project significantly if they had to run pipes uh, or discharge pipes to to the, to that to that uh, installation location yeah so I think this will improve then when a CO2 price will be introduced also to heating, right? So the whole situation will become better. Sig significantly, yes. Yes. So so we, we can hope for the outcome of the current discussion in Brussels. Albert, you have also prepared some uh, some good examples for the audience to, uh, to enjoy. Uh, please. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. Then, well, uh, I prepared six slides to explain one project that we present in this EPA bo booklet to explain uh, heat pumps in renovation. So this is just a house case study. Okay? Um, it's a family house. It's a detached house in the Netherlands. So detached house, what I'm saying, because according to Europe, detached house in 2018, it means around 53% of all the houses in Europe. Okay? So this is one house, but might be 53% of the houses in Europe. And also in the Netherlands, it is important because in the Netherlands, there, there is a regulation, a legislative change in mid of uh, 2018, that after many years that every, every building has to be connected to the gas grid at, at mid of 2018, this is not a force anymore. Okay, so this is a, a very important, important change in the Netherlands that has um, made that the heat pump market is growing quite a lot. Then uh, in this case, we have, um, uh, let me go to, to the next slide. So I, we have a, a, a house 
for people living. So this is also very quite common, this type of house. Surface 140 square meters. And uh, they have very efficient um, heating demand system. So they were using underfloor heating that only needs 35 degrees and domestic hot water. But the problem was that they were using super and efficient heating generation. So they were using uh, 25 kilowatt gas boiler. Uh, I'm putting COP 0 0.9, but it will be lower than 0 0.9 after so long time running. And the consumption per year, uh, this is coming from the homeowner, it's around 2,200 2, cubic meters per year or near 23,000 kilowatt uh, per year. Okay. So this is the situation that this house had. Um, and then the family wanted to make a renovation. They wanted, they had some money to invest and they have uh, some concerns, okay? Before that, uh, I want to show you the calculation because also we have the information of the other electrical devices in the house. So we are making the calculation that in this case, 90% of the energy of the house was used for heating and domestic hot water. So this is, was extremely high, higher than the European average. Then uh, this family had some concerns. One is about the, the energy. They, they want to have a net neutral home. Of course, for that you need green energy. And at the end, of course, they want to reduce and be more uh, decar decarbonized society, but they want to pay less. Eh? They want to have some savings at the end of the at the end of the year. Also, they had some fears eh? because uh, we know that, um, especially many years ago, uh, heat pumps had some bad press about the temperature comfort, especially when it's very cold outside. Also about the noise level. So they also were concerning about this. Okay, but at the end, we'll see that this, this was not an issue. And they want to have a peace of mind. So they want to be, to be sure that the system was working. They, want, they don't want to, to skip any comfort. Uh, they want to keep the comfort, but also knowing that the, everything is under control and the, the numbers that, of efficiency that they will get are matching with what the, the, they presented when they made the study. And also they want something for the future. So they want remote maintenance, okay, that uh, everything can be monitored from uh, some other place. And also nobody knows, but uh, the flexibility of heat pump is that you can use for cooling. Also you can connect a uh, PV, you can connect many other things around. So this is the flexibility of heat pump. Okay? Then to summarize, uh, they want to reduce energy for heating, keeping same comfort, okay? and uh, re use uh, renewable energy as much as possible. Then what was the solution? The solution, there are not many choices. So they combine the PV panels together with air to water heat pump. So in this case, they install uh, 24 PV panels, Panasonic uh, panels that are having high capacity and uh, all together are bringing 7.8 kilowatts and the expected production in that site at the end of the year, it's 7,500 per year. Okay? So that's uh, something that at the end we will use to see if, if they reach the, their first target of having ne neutral energy home. And they also combine uh, with air to water heat pump. So they were using a 25 kilowatt gas boiler According to the information of that house and the software calculation, uh, we need a nine kilowatt heat pump at minus nine degrees. Okay, so this is what this house is, was needing. Also considering that they were using for underfloor heating. So uh, here we can see immediately one of the benefits of the heat pump is that we have a lot of flexibility to select what is the right system in each of the house. Okay, so it's not just I'm putting any type of boiler because all are the same capacity. Here I can make a, with the design tools that we offer to the installers, we can select what is the most appropriate heat pump to have the best performance and the, low, the less energy possible. Then uh, about heat pump, we selected a, a TCAP, nine kilowatts all in one. So this TCAP is uh, able to work at, um, at very low temperatures. They can keep the nominal capacity down to minus 20. Since we said that uh, the, the design point was minus nine, so this is more than enough, okay? but 
but as we said, this family were very concerned about the comfort. So for them, it was very important that at up to minus nine, the capacity was not changing. So it was constant. And this is what the system is, is able to, to, to make it. So even uh, it's not having the frost, so it's meaning that we can reach this capacity even at minus nine or in minus 15. We don't need heater and we don't need to oversize the heat pump. Okay, so if in other uh, categories or other brands, maybe we need to go to 12 kilowatts or even higher. And then the, the indoor unit, because we are talking a split system, the advantage of a split system is that we don't need to use glycol because we are using refrigerant to connect from outdoors. So in this case, we have a tank inside that was enough for the, for the four members family. And this uh, is isolated with a Yubakwa panel that it's big in high efficiency. Also, this family, uh, they were concerned about remote maintenance. So they include the accessory to control from the cloud and giving access to the, to the installer for making the maintenance. Also, it's having a smart, is this a smart grid ready. This was very important to connect to the PV panels. And also, it's uh, having the piping at the bottom. So uh, as you, we can see here in the picture, we can use the above part uh, of the unit to allocate other parts of the heating system. Then what was the, the result? Uh, the result I split in different slides because they are very interesting things to see. So one is that the annual COP for heating was really, really high. So we could reach 5.06 for heating. 334 for uh, domestic hot water as a total the system it's 4.72 COP annual COP. Then um, we can see that uh, reaching the same demand um, we had to use a lot of energy before with the previous system because the COP was 0 0.9. So we have a, a power input is reduced almost 90,000 kilowatts here. It means we are re reducing 81% lower than, than gas. Okay. So that's a big improvement just with the heat pump. But this family Do you have any were information, really... uh, If I may interrupt, do you have any information on the self-consumption of, of that system? Like how much of the electricity can be used from the one that is produced on the roof? So specifically for the heat pump, we don't have yet this information because the, the project was made in May. So now wow. it's one year running. So we will we, we'll be able to start to analyze the, what is the data, but I could not get this for, for today. But okay. I, I, I make some numbers, not exactly the ones you need, but you will see that as, as total, it's, it's very good. Then in terms uh, of money, eh? so they, they also want to pay less. So uh, here we, we took the, the price of electricity in the Netherlands, the price of uh, gas in the Netherlands, and this is the result. So we can save just with uh, the cost of the energy. I'm not including maintenance because we know maintenance for gas boiler is more expensive than heat pump. Just with the electricity cost, we go almost savings of near 1,000 euros per year. In the case that we are using the energy from the grid, that is not the case for the 100 percent that. Okay, so we can see another benefit uh, of the heat pump that you can have a uh, big savings compared with gas boilers. Of course, this is depending very much on the on the on the balance between gas and electricity price, and this is changing country by country a lot. Okay, so this is a picture of, of this case in the Netherlands. And then um, uh, when we include the PV analysis, we can see that with the PV production, we can cover more than the total electrical power that they need. So we said that the PV production expected was 7.5,000 kilowatts. And when we take the heat pump power input with the other household electricity device, we go less. We go 6.5 thousand compared with this. Okay, so we have, we are producing more electricity than the one we need. Then, uh, Thomas, related to your question, eh? we don't know uh, during the day or during the night uh, if the heat pump was running and was using energy from the grid. Probably yes. So this number we don't have. But as total balance, we can say that they are uh, they are reaching the energy neutrality. They can sell electricity to the grid. Yeah. Okay, so. Yeah. Well, thank you. That that's already very good. Okay. So this is all that I prepared. So I think with this example that 
there are many examples like, like, like this in Europe. We can explain to anyone that, look, this is a good choice, this is flexible enough. We can cover with many things, many devices, and also we can use even for cooling if, if this is needed in the future. Okay, so that's, mm. that, that's all from my side I had prepared. Thank you. Thank you very much. Christiana, do you want to, to comment on what you have seen and heard so far? Because we will have your video later, so we have, sure. want to give you the floor. No problem. Uh, yes, I just wanted to make a comment because we're talking today about uh, renovation. And uh, actually, uh, these examples are perfectly fit for uh, new builds as well. And probably the NZEB nearly zero energy building standards that will kick in uh, next year uh, will be more massively appealing to this type of solutions and to this type of engineering. And coming to a comment that you made previously about the un unequal level of uh, maturity of technology across Europe. Um, if I take the example of France, back in the early 2010, so as, as soon as the uh, French building regulations kicked in, 2012 actually, um, there was, um, let's say, a, a coupling between uh, renewable heating and cooling and new build. So you could not, one, a homeowner could not possibly, or a project owner could not possibly get his building permit unless, unless the building calculation uh, was giving a satisfactory result. And this mm. was very greatly satisfied thanks to the use of uh, air to water heat pumps, for instance. So in the French market, um, project owners, installers were, were very, um, quickly incentivized or even they were not even left the, the choice anymore to but to turn towards air to water heat pumps so the the, the change of paradigm was forced uh, or um, introduced by legislation and i think that the nz standards will probably also trigger this kind of change of paradigm uh, so as much as they apply only for uh, new built i think that by extension renovation projects will also uh, be more uh, mature to uh, accept and to introduce this technology and these solutions, coupling PVs with uh, uh, air to water heat pumps. Uh, in our case, as a company, we have been the, 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 the world leaders in introducing uh, a solution which basically couples PV panel with a battery storage, uh, which is then used to um, make the air to water heat pump function. So we, we also um, have thought about it and we also offer a package solution, as we call it, of these three modules integrated by one single manufacturer. So it simplifies the installation uh, much more for an installer as opposed to having to do a uh, mix and match of different uh, modules. You have great foresight vision, Christiana, not only because I think this is a great solution, but also because you anticipated a question that I wanted to oh, ask to you. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, perfect, perfect. I have a few questions here that uh, that go uh, deep into detail. I would like to ask those that ask really specific questions, like what type of uh, wax are you using, Sanem? Can you ask that to Lucas directly? Because I will not bore the whole audience with these technical details. Uh, there's no, also no one... wax is the only thing I would like to say. It's the only thing you would like. <laughs> no, no, no wax because wax is flammable and therefore we don't use it in these systems. Okay, so no wax. The one of the things, uh, questions that we need to answer in this panel is there is, there is uh, where where did he go? Um, Stuart Brown has an 1860. Uh, Stone Villa in Edinburgh. Good for you, Stuart. Uh, he once renovated with an air source heat pump combi system and now it's not so good for him anymore because apparently the thing is leaking uh, like an open back of fleas and he would like to have the panel's opinion. Is that possible? What should he do? Can he replace uh, the existing gas boiler with an air source heat pump? And I would like to combine that question with one from uh, Alexander Korpachai who says, what, what is high temperature in your understanding? So high, how high can currently heat pumps go when they want to provide hot water for heating? I, I'd like, I think all of you have something to say to that. So let, let's make a tour. So uh, maybe, maybe let me start with, with, with this. This is a very interesting question. We see in the market that there is like a fight who is having the biggest number okay, in the catalog. But the question is, really too, what... could you try again? Hello? My stupid iPad. I want to. Ah, okay, okay. <laughs> that it was additional question in the middle of the reply. Then, oh, uh, 
then then what what I was saying is that uh, the, the question is good. What's happening when the temperature is dropping? Eh? So that's why we, we think that first we we don't we we think that 65 uh, degrees uh, radiators should be replaced because at the end is not bringing efficient house. Okay, so this is something that same as we want to ban uh, fossil fuels, we should ban these very old radiators also. And or, or incentivate the replacement to go to some temperature that is really bringing more efficiency. Okay. So that that uh, for, for us is uh, the important point. And starting the battle if 65 centi or this, this is meaningless if you cannot bring this temperature at very low tem uh, at very old, low outdoor temperature. Okay. So uh, I think while well, there are systems that are promoting 60, 65, but when you go minus 10. They drop to 55, 50, or even lower. So we should be very transparent to the end users, uh, all the manufacturers, because we can drive to to misunderstanding and at the end uh, bringing to bad image to the heat pump market. That is something that we don't want. Okay. Um, I have one other question that goes in the same direction. Can you make 60 degrees hot water at minus 28 degrees? Um, I, I'm not the technician, but I think that uh, that's not possible at two, minus 28 degrees. Yeah, I'd, I'd say that, it is, that there is a bit of an operating limit and minus 28 yeah. is, is really uh, where yeah. the heat pump for sure cannot deliver the capacity anymore that the house would need. Yeah. So in this case, uh, just to be also very clear, what the association and its members recommend in this case is not to bet 100% on heat pumps. Then you need a hybrid solution. However, if you look at Europe's temperature ranges, then this is not the standard uh, problem. It's not the standard case. So it's not helping if we point to these uh, these areas where the heat pump cannot deliver 100%, whereas we have. 75% uh, or similar of other areas where it can completely and perfectly deliver and use a compound. I wanted to allow the other two panelists also to contribute to this question. 1860 House, what do we do? Um, so, well, as LG, we do uh, manufacture and market uh, a high temperature unit uh, which uh, can reach uh, 80 degrees uh, water outlet temperature. Um, and it is intended for a market where the building envelope is really poor and where there are thermal breaks that make the house mm -hmm. very, very uncomfortable. So um, it fits uh, a need which uh, is there, we cannot ignore it. And um, there, there is some uh, amount of, uh, uh, let's say, requests uh, towards these type of, of units. It's a reality. So from from our point of view, um, this can actually be addressed um, with a high temperature heat pump and and an intermittent buffer store. Um, heat pumps don't like to run in the same patterns that gas boilers currently do in the UK. Um, but if you use uh, an adequately sized uh, energy buffer in between, you can run your heating system in the same pattern that you run it today. And on the same um, on on the on the same uh, temperatures as as today, um, but you can run the heat pump in uh, a much more um, controlled and um, appropriate pattern. Um, and this is essentially what we do. Um, we we so with regards to to a specific case uh, of an 1860 victorian uh, house uh, or semi detached house in in edinburgh um i would take it in stages um removing the microbore and uh, other systems that are that that were mentioned in that question um is not absolutely a necessity um but what should be done is um to look at the radiator sizes so that they can run it at a 55 degree centigrade maximum flow temperature um upgrade the heating system and then take other measures uh in stages it can't mm -hmm. be well it can be done all in one go 
but then obviously there is a, a, a huge disruption. Uh, usually you will have to leave uh, the property for, for quite some time during the renovation in that case. Yeah. Super, thank you very much. Uh, we have here a few more questions. High temperature bonds we have solved. Um, we have one question specifically to Christiana. Uh, could you give us a bit more information about the French case? Um, I guess this is also referring to the Coupe de Puce, the heat pump that is available for one euro. And maybe also, uh, then I would extend the question to all, where do you see the impact of government subsidies and government support systems for the development of the heat pump markets? Start with you, Christiana, and then Albert and Lucas, you could comment. Uh, well, incentives have uh, been unequally, uh, let's say, spread across Europe. Each country has its own uh, method and its own incentive scheme in place. Um, France has been uh, quite heavily subsidizing air to water heat pumps. Uh, they have been subsidizing um, manpower required to remove uh, older inefficient systems. So there has been a very big focus in actually uh, increasing the, the renovation rate and directly by pushing, you know, pushing uh, uh, renovation of the heating systems. Um, the latest update in the French uh, incentive schemes uh, is now removing this amount of uh, support for higher revenue projects uh, and uh, is rather putting the focus on uh, lower revenue projects uh, or project owners. So we, we will have to see how the, the market reacts to this uh, to this change, to this adjustment. Um, however, generally speaking, policy has this capacity of actually pointing where the merits lie. And in a way, showing that there is there are scrappage schemes in preparation uh, for gas boilers is symbolically at least a good a good uh, element to take on board as regards the dynamics for the um, renewable uh, sources for heating and cooling so um, uh, overall we have seen that the market has been positively reacting to picking up incentives and that uh, project owners are making use of them financial engineering of um, um, calculating uh, what the return investment of a project uh, will be is complex but doable. So I think that manufacturers also have this, have this responsibility of educating their customers and their customers' customers in understanding uh, what is at stake. So calculations about uh, uh, the return on investment, uh, energy simulations are powerful tools when they embed this logic of uh, uh, bonuses and incentives to make the project understandable to the end user. Super, thank you. Lucas, Albert? Yeah, and in terms of incentives, um, incentives in our view are important to create a market and to help it grow and, and professionalize. We have seen this um, time and time again with, with renewable energy um, or renewable electricity, um, but it is really important that the incentives uh, are not the only reason uh, why new solutions are being installed, because this over the long run is not a, a tenable solution. I think that with regards to the heat pump market, we see two things happening at the moment. First of all, we see um, incentives more and more coming from the market itself in the way of uh, variable tariffs um, and basically a, a remuneration of flexibility. Um, on the other hand, um, we, we, we also think uh, that the huge imbalance that still exists in the treatment of uh, fossil energies and electricity uh, with regards mm -hmm. to taxes, with regards to subsidies, uh, has to stop uh, in order for the, the markets to become uh, self-supporting as quickly as possible. Let's hope for that. I'll bet. I have an well, additional add-on for, for one more question asking can you comment on the previous, but also look at the Netherlands? Uh, what type of support do we need in the Netherlands to get this country off gas? I, I, I tend to refer to it as 
uh, a drug addict in front of the train station, right? You say you don't need drugs, and that's like the Netherlands with gas. Everybody has gas, but what does it need to change this country from gas to um, heat pumps? Mm -hmm. Well, the, the the regulation is there. They start uh, in mid of uh, 2018, and in 2021, according to the information I got, it's that I think it's 2021. They will start to disconnect 50,000 households per year to the gas grid. Mm -hmm. So it's not new house only. Yeah? It's in, in houses that are already connected to the network. They they will start to disconnect, and they have a plan in the next 10 years, I think to disconnect every year more and more households. So they will start with 50,000, that is not a small number, and they plan in the high level, I think it's 2030 uh, at that time to disconnect 200 houses per year. So it's a very challenging plan. I don't know the details. I don't know what will be the incentive, but these are what I, I, I get from my colleagues in the Netherlands. We have five minutes left, and we need three of that for Christiana's video. So, uh, can I ask you for a final round of statements, one sentence or two, for the Green Deal, for the renovation wave? What would you think is the most important measure that policymakers should take, shall take, to make it a success? And let's go via Albert, Lucas, and then we finish with Christiana, who can then start the video at her disposal. Mm -hmm. Albert. Yeah, so well, for me now it's a big opportunity for policymakers. We are in front of a new situation that never happened before, and we need to put many incentives into, into the economy. So let's put in a way that we are having some return in the future. So I think in, in renovation, if we can put some money, we will create uh, many jobs probably, and also we'll invest in the future for our less energy dependency and also to reach the energy targets. Mm -hmm. Lucas? Yeah, in terms of the um, green recovery, from our point of view, it is very important that, first of all, there's not only money thrown at things uh, to push water uphill, uh, while the fundamental challenges uh, around the energy prices still persist, um, measures should be taken in both directions. Uh, both supporting installations and improving the, econo the fundamental economics. Um, on the other side, or, or another point uh, that we see as very important, is that both um, renovation in terms of energy efficiency improvements and in terms of upgrades of uh, heating systems or replacements with heat pumps are, are tackled at the same time. Um, if you look at the numbers, it is very, very questionable whether we have enough time uh, until 2050 to wait for all houses to be uh, renovated uh, or fully uh, insulated down to, to whatever level you're looking for uh, and then start to uh, install new heating systems. Um, this will mean that we will miss our, our, our targets by, by a mile. Mm. So you're saying start immediately and then go step by step? S start immediately, start on both ends. And then those where you have made the heating system upgrade first, you can insulate after and vice versa. Uh, it will essentially lead to um, even better uh, systems than before. Good or even more, flexi even more flexible systems than before. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Christiana, you're muted. I'm sorry. Um, well, if we are aiming at uh, carbon neutrality by 2050, which is uh, uh, a very uh, ambitious target, we should start right away. Um, and I think that decar decarbonizing the energy sector is probably the right, the right start uh, to make the most of uh, using and deploying renewable energy sources for heating and cooling. Thank you. That's very nice closing remarks. I could not have said that better, really. Uh, should we then finish the session with watching your video? And thank you already, Lucas and Albert. I think that you have to go sharp, so uh, we will not leave, keep you any longer. Please start the video. Thank you very much. Thank you to the audience. We had uh, close thank to 120 you. people today, and I hope you found it interesting. If you have any other questions that we didn't answer now, please ask them to the speakers directly or contact the EHPA. Have a great day. Thank you.
Thank you very much. So now we lost Christiana uh, and also the video. <laughs> there we go. Christiana, maybe you can just give a short rundown because it's barely audible. Okay. Let me. Uh, can can you hear me and see me? Yeah, let me just run and explain briefly what uh, what you think is the main achievement of this project. All right, I'll do that. So I think that um, the the main uh, takeaway of this project is that uh, we're talking about a huge site, which is the headquarters of a, a big construction company in Europe, with, in France, with pan-European operations. And uh, we have been able to remove uh, an old uh, system and replace it with um, a water-to-water -water heat pump to supply for the full uh, heating and cooling needs of this building, which uh, uh, combines at the same time human thermal comfort, but also uh, data centers, and production sites, which are all in the, in the same location. Um, and all consumption targets have been slashed by almost 50%, if not more. And thanks to this, um, let's say, uh, engineering capacity, uh, the building was awarded a triple um, golden certification under BRIAM in the UK, LEED in the US, and uh, the ASHQE, which is the French uh, certification for uh, highly energy performing buildings. So it's it was it's a way to show that uh, even for big commercial projects, heat pumps can uh, efficiently operate. Uh, the site is managed 24/7 uh, with um, uh, controllers, and um, there have been no failures to this project since uh, it was uh, launched. So it has been a great pride for G to. Uh, be associated to this project and it has also fed us with a lot of uh, uh, engineering capacity and knowledge about how to design systems that meet very very high expectations from the customer side so just to give you uh, let's say um, another perspective on the commercial application of a heat pump uh, as opposed to the residential applications which were mentioned earlier during the, the, the workshop so uh, well, it's actually it, great. It, it's it's a great conclusion of also this session because it opens the door as the person on the screen is about to do. He he will leave this room, I assume, opening a door. But this opens the door for a completely different application area of large heat pumps when we look at commercial applications and industrial solutions, also distributing 
uh, is something that we can deploy the same technology in. We will cover this in other webinars, or you can come back to us with specific questions. We have a, a, a large group of expert insights and associations that are happy to share the knowledge that is available. I would like to conclude with saying that we have technology available to fully decarbonize the building sector. Thank you to my panel today, and let's continue this debate over the course of this year. Have a great day, and see you next time. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you. Bye-bye.